Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the invitation. It's fantastic being here. I'm going to start, I think, with an email I received two years ago, which made me laugh a lot. And it said, I'm a reporter at the Huffington Post. I just want to verify that you're real, as there's a rumor going around the internet that you're a Banksy prank. And I am obviously frequently mistaken for a work of art, right? So um, I will explain a little bit later in my talk how that email came about. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the general area of my research. And this is something called geographic profiling. And it kind of owes its beginning to, to this guy. Absolutely fascinating character. His name is Kim Rossmo, and he is an ex-beat cop. He's Canadian. He became a detective and investigated a number of high-profile cases of serial murder. And he's currently uh, a professor uh, in Texas. Really, really good guy, close friend, and a good collaborator of mine. And Kim's great insight in the 1990s was to realize that in cases of serial crime, the problem is never that you don't have any suspects. The problem is that you have far too many suspects. You have stupid numbers of suspects, far too many to actually investigate. And the textbook example of this is this guy. This is not a close personal friend of mine and not a collaborator. <laughs> um, someone recognized him. This is Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper. And he was convicted in 1980 of 13 murders. And the Yorkshire Ripper case remains the largest manhunt in UK police history. And that inquiry generated 268,000 names and 5.4 million vehicle registrations. And even today with you know, modern DNA technology, you can't easily DNA test 268,000 people, let alone 5.4 million. You, you can't interview them, you can't place them under surveillance, you, you can't do anything. So what you need to do is you need to find a way to sort that list. You want to prioritize your investigation of these 268,000 suspects so that Peter Sutcliffe is near the top. He doesn't have to be the top name. You just want to make sure that you find the guy you're looking for without having to search all 268,000 names. So to illustrate that, I'm going to turn to what is actually the second biggest manhunt in UK police history. And this is Operation Lynx. And this was a series of very nasty sexual assaults, GBH, uh, grievous bodily harm, and attempted kidnappings. And the police in this case had a partial fingerprint. And the problem with partial fingerprints is at the time, you can't analyze them using the automated computer software. You have to check them all manually. And that means there's a limit to what you can do. So again, you need to prioritize your suspect list. And the way you do this in geographic profiling is you use the spatial lo locations associated with the crimes. So these might be things like victim encounter site, body dump site, vehicle dump site, wedding, uh, sorry, uh, weapon dump sites and things, <laughs> weddings. That was a Freudian slip there. Um, and in this case, uh, actually some places where a stolen credit card had been used. So those red dots on that map are areas associated with that series of crimes. You do some really nice maths, uh, and I'll come to the mathematics in a moment or two, and you produce something that looks like a multicolored mountain range overlaid on your, your target area. And one word of caution, Kim and I uh, agree on a lot of things, but we disagree about the use of colors in maps. Um, this is one of Kim's maps. All of my color schemes are going to be different. Here, red is at the top, okay? So the basic idea here is, is very, very simple. You have your 268,000 or whatever suspects, and you investigate them in order of their height on this multicolored mountain range, the geo profile. So you start with people who live or work in the red areas, and you move down to the orange, the yellow, the green, and so on. What you're trying to do, as I say, is limit the amount of work you have to do before you catch the bad guy. So out there somewhere are a whole bunch of offenders. The ones the police know about are typically ones who already have a criminal record, either for the same kind of crime or for related crimes, things like animal cruelty. That's too many people to investigate. 
Of course, you have witness descriptions as well. In this case, they knew they were looking for a male aged between uh, 35 and 52. But that area in the middle still has 33,000 names in it. Okay, far too many to investigate. But once you add the information from the GEO profile, you're restricting that 33,000 names to the ones who live in those two peaks, the two red areas. Now you're down to just a couple of thousand. Now this is doable. And indeed, they did it. They matched the partial fingerprint. They confirmed it with a DNA test, which led them to this very unpleasant person. This is Clive Barwell, who was the criminal. Two blue squares on the map are Clive Barwell's house and his mum's house. And he's committing the crimes in areas he's familiar with, around those two areas. So how do we produce this multicolored mountain range? There are actually different models out there. I'm going to talk about one uh, which was developed in my research group, because it's the best, right? <laughs> um, and actually, the, some of the maths is quite complicated, but what it's doing is quite simple. So what this graph is showing is, is my house at zero in, in London and distance from my house along the x-axis in completely arbitrary made-up units. And on the y-axis, we have my probability of committing a crime as a function of distance from my house. And all this graph is saying is that, you know, I'm lazy. I'm, I'm going to commit crimes near my house rather than further away. Right? If, if I want to murder someone, I can't be bothered going to Stansted Airport, jumping on a plane, coming to Sofia. It just takes too much time. Right? I'm going to kill people in South East London. Okay? And that's all this graph is saying. Now, if you're really thinking about this, the problem is, that graph is, is very simple, but it isn't what we want to know. That graph is describing the probability that I commit a crime somewhere, given that we know I live where I do. Now, we don't know where the killer lives. If we did, we don't have to do the maths. We just go and knock on his door and arrest him. What we are trying to calculate is the probability that I live somewhere, given that we know I commit crimes where I do. We do know where the crimes are. We don't know where the criminal lives. Now, those of you who've, who've done any probability theory will recognize these as conditional probabilities. And conditional probabilities have the form, what is the probability of A if B is true? And the crucial thing about them is that that is usually very, very different from what is the probability of B if A is true. So here's a cartoon to illustrate this. This is saying, what is the probability that I am over six feet tall, given that, which is what the straight line means, given that I'm an NBA basketball player? If you know I'm an NBA basketball player, you can be really, really confident that I'm over six feet tall. Almost all professional basketball players, not quite all, but almost all, are over six feet tall. So that probability is really, really high. On the other hand, the probability that I'm an NBA basketball player, given that I'm over six feet tall, is very, very low. There are lots of people over six feet tall. Not many of them, only about 400, are NBA basketball players. Can you stick your hand up if you're over six feet tall? This example goes badly wrong. Are any of you NBA basketball players? <laughs> Thank goodness for that. OK, <laughs> you should have just said yeah. Um, so that's our first problem. And the good news is this was solved by the Reverend Thomas Bayes. And this is Bayes' rule, or Bayes' theorem. And really all you have to take from this slide is that it takes one conditional probability, so on the top line, the probability of B if A is true, and it turns it into the other one, the probability of A if B is true. So this equation allows us to go from that graph, the bit we do know, the probability that I commit crimes somewhere, given that we know I live where I do, and turn it into the bit we want to know, which is what's the probability that I live somewhere, given the pattern of crimes. So Thomas Bayes has solved our first problem, which leads me to our second problem. Um, this is me, incidentally, looking extremely happy to be visiting the grave of Thomas Bayes, which... If you do my kind of job, it's just really quite a big treat. So all we do, all the model really, really does is it says, OK, well, let's suppose I live here. Given that, what is the probability of seeing this pattern of crimes? That's actually relatively easy to calculate. We use Bayes' rule to turn it round and say, well, OK, given that pattern of crimes, what's the probability that I live here? And then we do that for all ways we can group the crimes, for the probability that I live here, 
or here, or that my mum lives here, or whatever. And we integrate over all of those to find the answer. And this is the second problem. That's a lot of stuff to integrate over. For 100 crimes, and bear in mind for some of my disease data sets that I'll talk about later, we're in the thousands. But for just 100 crimes, we have to integrate over that many things. Now that is 30 million, 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 million times the number of protons in the universe. So that's going to take a while. For a thousand crimes, actually, the situation is even worse. We have to do that many sums. That actually is the exact number, by the way. Um, and to put this into context, if we had done a billion calculations a second since the universe began, we'd have done that much of the problem. So we cannot do that. For realistic numbers of crimes, we simply cannot solve this analytically. Luckily, our second problem has been solved too by two fantastic PhD students. That's Mark Stevenson at the top and Bob Verity at the bottom. The really good news is I'm not going to go through all that maths. Uh, but I am going to show you what the maths does because I think it's, it's important. And it hinges on a very simple idea that what the model is trying to do is answer two questions. It's trying to answer the question of which crimes come from which source. So if we look at the Clive Barwell case, which crimes come from his mum's house? Which crimes originate at his house? And it's trying to say, OK, well, where is his mum's house? Where is the criminal's house? And those two questions are, are very difficult to answer together. But the key insight turns out to be that there, one of them is easy to answer if you know the other one. Okay? And in fact, the solution was provided really by this guy, Josiah Willard Gibbs. How, how's that for a testimonial? The greatest mind in American history, Albert Einstein. I, I would settle for that. And all the Gibbs sampler does is it switches between those two jobs. Okay? So it says, well, let's suppose this is the grouping of crimes. Well, here are the sources. Right, now let's suppose these are the sources. This is the grouping of crimes. So I'm going to illustrate that now. So let's suppose these are our 10 crimes. And I'm going to cheat a little bit to make the example easier. I'm going to pretend we already know there are two sources. Uh, in fact, we don't, and the model doesn't care. But the explanation is a lot easier if you let me pretend that. So we start by saying, OK, let's invent some groupings. We'll say these come from source 2, and these other ones come from source 1. And this is completely random. This doesn't actually have to make any sense at all. Okay? We don't have to, to, to have any special knowledge. But what we do in the Gibbs sampler is we say, well, OK, let's suppose that's true. Well, where is the source of those ones? And actually, it's easy. It, it's probably in the middle. So you can think of this as a, as a kind of bullseye. And we're going to pick something from that target. And we're most likely to pick something near the middle. But we might pick something a bit further away. And in fact, we've, we've picked something kind of halfway along. We do the same for the twos. They obviously center somewhere around there. We pick one, and fantastic. We know where source one and source two are. Except, of course, we don't, because the groupings are stupid. right? So we throw the groupings away. And the Gibbs sampler switches to the second part of the problem. And it says, well, OK, let's suppose those are the sources. Which ones come from the blue source? Which ones come from the red source? And Clearly, they're most likely, not definite, but most likely, to come from the source they're nearest. So we just go back to the first job, and we say, well, OK, if those are the twos, let's pick a two. And we've updated our two, and we've updated our one. So you can see that dot has moved, and the line is showing you where it's moved, right? So all the Gibbs sampler does is does that again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Again, 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 again. And eventually we build up quite a complex probability surface, which we can map with a much better color scheme than Kim's. In this one, yellow is at the top. So what this is telling you is the model thinks there are probably two sources. You can see there are kind of two main yellow areas, yeah? Now, I made this simulation up, so I do know the answer. And that's where the sources were. So the model has, has done very well. So before we move on to some, some cases, all we need now is a way to measure how well the model has done. And I, I used to get into a lot of difficulties explaining this. No one ever got it and, until I explained it using this game, Battleships. 
And, and Lubomir assures me that, that people will know battleships. Do you know this game? You have a kind of grid of squares. And you, yeah, okay. We're going to pretend this is a very simple game of battleships. We have one battleship in a 12 by 12 grid. And as soon as we hit it, it sinks. And if we guess randomly, sometimes, right, we're going to be lucky. And in the example on the left, we've had four goes, and then we've hit ba the battleship, and we've sunk it. So we've searched four out of 144 of the squares, which is about 3%. So I'm going to call that the hit score. And 3% is how much of that area we had to search before we find what we're looking for, the battleship. Of course, sometimes we're going to be unlucky. And on the right, we've been pretty unlucky. Um, we had to have 99 guesses before we actually hit the battleship. So the hit score now is 69%. We've had to search 69% of the area before we've sunk the battleship. Okay? So really, the take-home message here is low hit scores are good, high hit scores are bad, because a low hit score means we haven't had to search many squares, or we haven't had to look at many of that 268,000 suspects, or when I get onto malaria, we haven't had to search much of Cairo before we find what we're looking for, the battleship, Peter Sutcliffe, the sources of the malarial outbreak. Okay? In Clive Barwell's case, those two houses, his house and his mum's house, are both in the top 3% of the surface. Okay? So we only have to search under 3% of that 33,000 names before we found Clive Barwell. Okay, so this stuff works, and it's routinely used by law enforcement around the world. I, I don't do any of the criminal stuff, Kim does, but this is used by, you can see some of the badges here, uh, the FBI, the CIA, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, Metropolitan Police in London, uh, the Los Angeles Police, the US Marine Corps, all over the world, and it's used because it works, and it's been used in a lot of high-profile cases of serial crime. So on the left, we've got some, some fairly unpleasant serial killers. We've mentioned the Yorkshire Ripper. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, Dahmer the cannibal. And various others, the um, Son of Sam, Boston Strangler. The Hillside Strangler was, was two people, two cousins, Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Buono, and it finds both of their houses. Uh, interestingly, Bianchi was the one in charge, and it finds his house first, which is, is pretty interesting. And generally, the hit scores are very, very good. All right, so this works in criminology. I'm in the east end of London at, at Queen Mary University. We have to do Jack the Ripper because the cases were about a mile from my office. They were in 1888, so it wasn't me. Um, and Kim and I talked about this at the Cheltenham Science Festival a couple of years ago. And the important point here is there are five victims. Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly. The two that are going to be important for us are Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes. And they were killed on the same night, and that turns out to be important. Uh, September the 30th, 1888. Now, this is the places where the bodies were found. This is London. If you look down to the bottom left, you can see Tower Bridge and the Tower of London. Uh, the queue is, is my university, Queen Mary. My office is in the middle of that queue, okay? That's, that's exactly why I put that up there. This one is actually really easy, but it's interesting anyway. So if you run the GEO profile with the nice color scheme, you get this. And you can see this one central yellow area that's basically in the middle of the, the five crimes. And actually, that's interesting, because in that yellow area is Flower and Dean Street. And Flower and Dean Street was described at the time as the wicked quarter mile, the foulest and most dangerous street in the whole metropolis. And it had illegal drinking dens, brothels, gambling, all, all kinds of stuff. It was where the detectives at the time thought Jack the Ripper probably lived. And four of the five victims were last seen in Flower and Dean Street or in a street that adjoined it. And that is the top 1% of the surface. And you can see Flower and Dean Street sits really, really neatly in it. Now, no one knows who Jack the Ripper is. But the reason I think this is interesting is, if you recall, Stride at the bottom right and Eddowes at the bottom left were killed on the same night. Stride is the only victim who isn't badly mutilated. And it seems that the killer was interrupted and ran away. And he's clearly unsatisfied because later on, he goes and kills Catherine Eddowes. 
And in the early hours of that morning, some of her bloodstained clothing is found here uh, at Gulston Square, uh, famously with a, a message chalked on the wall from the Ripper. But the reason I think this is interesting is if he lives in Flower and Dean Street, the Red Line, and he's gone off and murdered Elizabeth Stride and then been interrupted, and then he's gone west a bit and killed Catherine Eddowes, he's on his way home, right? He's, he's dropping that, the bloodstained clothing on his way home, which is exactly what he would do. So we don't know who the Ripper is, but I, I do think that's interesting. To really show you the model working, we need a case where we do know the answer. And some of you may know this case. This is the case of Otto and Elise Hampel. Uh, and I like this one. We published this in a journal which is so highly classified that I'm not allowed to read it. You can only read it if you're in the CIA, the NSA, or American military intelligence. Uh, ours, our article is unclassified. We're the first outsiders ever to publish in this. So I can tell you about it without having to kill you afterwards. Um, but what we analyzed is, you may know this book, the English title is Alone in Berlin. The German title is Every Man Dies Alone. And it's a fictionalized account, it was written in 1946, of the case of Otto and Elise Hampel on the left. And it's a famous example of German resistance to the Nazis during the Second World War. And Otto and Elise decided very, very bravely that they would try and encourage rebellion. And the way they decided to go about this was to write postcards with anti-Nazi messages. They, they would say things like, you know, Germans awake, Hitler is killing your children, don't pay the winter fuel tax. And they left these postcards around apartment buildings in Berlin. So Kim, Mark and I went to Berlin, we got the Gestapo file from the Bundesarchive, and we went all around Berlin, geocoding those addresses that you can see on the right. And what we get is this map. And actually, the structure of the map is so detailed that we have to zoom in to, to see the area of interest. But if we zoom right in, again, now we're, we're now so accurate the dots are getting in the way, right? So we replot it at very high resolution. And you see that peak uh, round about the center. That blue square is Otto and Elise Hampel's house. Okay? It's that accurate. And it even distinguishes it from Anna Bartnick's house. She was Otto's sister, uh, lived at the other end of the street and Gustav and Pauline Hampel, who were Otto's parents at the opposite end. So we've gone from this area, okay, this is 146 square miles, down to this area, basically one city block. This is Amsterdam Strasse, where Otto and Elise lived. But we get even more information than this. So we, the model finds a peak at Siemens, where Otto worked, and it finds Elise's brother's house, uh, down around Kreuzberg, I think, um, because they're dropping postcards when they go to visit him. And actually, we were a bit puzzled by the other ones, but Schoenhauser Alley and Hallisch Tor are the tube stations you have to use if you go from Wedding, which is where Otto and Elise lived, down to see Elise's brother. So they're changing tube, jumping up, dropping a postcard, going back down. Okay? So the model works fantastically well. Crucially, in fact, you can use, in, in total, if you see the yellow line at the bottom, there are 215 cases, and we have 205 precise addresses. And as I said, the hit score is tiny, less than 0.01 of a percent. So the target area is 146 square miles. We have to search about 0.1 of a square mile. But that's true even if we use, if you look at the top line, just the first 35 cases. Okay, we still only have to search 0.13 of a square mile. He's sticking closer to home at this point, so the start is only 34 square miles. He's not going as far at the beginning. But we, we can see that this works really fantastically well. Tragically, they were caught. You know, in this case, we are really mu very much on the side of the Hampels. Uh, but they were witness dropping a postcard. Otto was seen. He was denounced to the Gestapo. And this is Mark and Kim outside the spot where they're house stood. The plaque at the back says, here stood the house in which Otto and Elise Hampel lived from 1934 until their arrest. Uh, the couple were executed at Plots and Say on the 8th of April, 1943. Their struggle against the inhumanities of the National Socialist regime was the inspiration for Hans Falada's novel, Every Man Dies Alone. Two very, very brave people. Now, the reason that 
the, the NSA and people were interested in this case is going to bring me back actually to Banksy. Because in counterterrorism, there has been a suggestion for, for a long time that terrorist groups frequently use things like graffiti and leafleting, like the Hampels, to establish a political presence. And the idea in counterterrorism has been, well, if you can find them at that point, before they blow stuff up, that would be fantastic. Okay? So from my point of view, the Hampel case is a good example of leafleting, where we know the source, it was Otto and Elise Hampel. And the Banksy data is, of course, a really well-documented set of graffiti artworks, which we know are all by one person. So, we analysed it. And the first point I need to make before anyone gets into the ethical stuff is everybody knew who Banksy was already. Everybody, right? He was named as, as this guy, uh, Robin Gunningham, in a national newspaper with a circulation in the millions in 2008. And I checked before our study, he was named on 70,000 web pages. Everybody knew who Banksy was. But we checked, and yeah, we, we could have found him. And this was work one of my undergraduate students did in her final year for her research project. And this is Michelle. Uh, there's a Banksy artwork behind her. And there is her research assistant, Troll the Pug, who, who apparently visited every single site with her. But she trekked all around London and all around Bristol, where the majority of Banksy artworks are. This is the geo profile we get. And again, if we zoom in, you can see there's a couple of areas that the model thinks are sources. And again, if we plot at higher resolution, actually he's avoiding his own house, but Joy Millward was his girlfriend and now wife. And he's basically using that as a base for his artworks. In Bristol, the picture's even better. Uh, the bottom square in that central peak is where Robin Gunningham lived when he was an art student in Bristol. And the playing fields are where he played football. He played football for his pub team. He's a goalkeeper, if, if anyone's interested. Uh, but all goalkeepers are crazy, anyway. Um, so we can find Banksy. But, oh dear me, I got flamed on social media <laughs> for this. There was an awful lot of press coverage. And actually, embarrassingly, given that I teach our students conditional probabilities, I forgot that everyone gets it wrong. Because if you look at the paper, in the abstract, there is a line. More broadly, these results support previous suggestions that analysis of minor terrorism-related acts, e.g. graffiti, could be used to help locate, right? So what we're saying is lots of terrorists use graffiti. You've got it, right? What well, everyone else heard, graffiti artists are terrorists. <laughs> TV interviewers kept asking me, do you think Banksy's a terrorist? Like, no, why? Of course he's not. The probability that you engage in graffiti, given that you're a terrorist, is really high. The probability that you're a terrorist, given that you spray stencils on walls, is like really, really small. And I should have remembered that people get confused by conditional probabilities. Okay, by now you're obviously wondering why on earth I work in a biology department. So I'm going to finish with some biology, luckily. And the beautiful thing about lots of areas of mathematics, and I, I know Maggie works on a lot of Bayesian statistics as well, is that very often the same mathematics underlies processes which at first sight look completely different. And that's the case with, with this kind of method. So in criminology, you know, murder, rape, burglary and arson, we use the spatial locations of linked crimes, as, as we saw with Operation Lynx or, or Jack the Ripper, and we're trying to find areas associated with the offender, where he might live or, or work. And we can do the same in biology. If we know where animals are feeding, we can find their nests or their roosts or, or their dens. But invasion biology is a massive problem. So invasive species are, are probably a bigger cause of biodiversity loss than habitat destruction. So if we know where invasive species are now, we can use geographic profiling to find where they're spreading from. And that means we can go and control them and hopefully stop them displacing native species. I'm going to finish in a minute, actually, with epidemiology, which is, I think, the most exciting area of research at the moment. And that idea is, if we know the addresses of people with a particular infection, West Nile virus, cholera, uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, malaria, if we know that, we can work out the source of the infection, which means we can go and kill the mosquitoes that spread malaria, okay? 
or we can target people for leafleting and screening. And I'm doing a lot of work with the NHS in the UK at the moment along these lines. So we've applied this to, to bats. We can, we can find bat roosts. Bees, my favorite part of this, by the way, is labeling the bee. You see that little number on the back of the bee? I did that, that's a nice fiddly job. Um, I wasn't involved in this one, but Kim was. They, they've studied patterns of great white shark predation on seals off uh, Cape Town. Uh, we've looked, as I said, at lots of invasive species. We've looked at invasive mink. I like that picture. I guess it looks even better because you can see the big screen. Um, invasive mink in the Scottish Hebrides. Uh, tarsiers in the Indonesian jungle. Yeah, they are quite cute. And this one, which actually is going back to crime. So this is poaching in a game conservancy in Zimbabwe. And, and this is catastrophic. There are you know, more than 10,000 snares in this data set. And there are nearly 7,000 dead animals some of them very highly endangered. And this is in a game conservancy. Okay? You can see the shape of the conservancy very clearly outlined, but this is an interesting problem because you have to, if you're going to go and catch these animals, you have to catch them in the conservancy because that's the only place you find the animals. But most of the poachers live outside the conservancy. So actually we've had to do some extra mathematical manipulation to ensure that the model only looks at the really important areas inside the conservancy and actually pushes outside the conservancy more because that's where most of the poachers actually live. And we're working with some NGOs and wildlife organizations on this kind of stuff uh, at the moment. But I said I, I wanted to finish with epidemiology, with the study of disease biology. And I'm going to start because I think there's a bylaw that says if you work in epidemiology, you have to analyze this. And this is the 1854 cholera outbreak, publicized by Jon Snow, not that one. <laughs> the Game of Thrones has ruined this talk. And Jon Snow was, was the father of epidemiology, and absolute genius. He had an idea that no one had ever had before, which was to map a disease outbreak. So this is 1854. Nobody knows what cholera is. No one even knows cholera is a waterborne disease. But John Snow mapped this, and there are 616 deaths, most of them in this area. And the black squares on that map, this is Soho in London, the black squares are houses where people died in the outbreak. And John Snow noticed, this is our analysis of the same, John Snow noticed that most of the cases centered on that blue square in the middle. The blue squares are the neighborhood water pumps. And the pump in the middle is the Broad Street pump. And Snow, having mapped this, thought that's the source of the infection. So he arranged to have the handle taken off the pump and stopped the outbreak. In fact, the case, the case is fantastic to read about. Um, I say there were 616 victims, most of them in this area. Uh, there were tragically some school children who lived outside the area but went to school there and they got their water during the day from Broad Street. Uh, there was one fantastically unlucky woman who lived a few miles north, but she liked the taste of the water, and she used to send her son down to Broad Street to collect it, which, as it turns out, was a fantastically poor idea. But my very favorite bit is there were a whole bunch of guys in the middle of this map, none of whom got cholera, and they worked at a brewery. <laughs> none of them touched water. <laughs> Our model finds the Broad Street pump as well. Um, in fact, the very highest point on the surface is literally about 10 feet away, okay? Um, but actually, it's not that impressive. I mean, Snow was a genius. Mapping this was an idea of genius. But once you've mapped it, the answer's obvious because it's one cluster, so you're just gonna look in the middle, okay? So it's not surprising that the model finds it. Everything finds it. The one I do think is impressive is, is this one. And this is an outbreak of malaria between 2001 and 2004 in Cairo. Now, those dates are going to be important. So it's 2001 to 2004. This is a map of Cairo, and the black squares are the addresses of 139 people who contracted a plasmodium vivax infection of malaria. And what the public health experts on the ground did was they surveyed basically all of Greater Cairo, about 300 square kilometers, for standing water because malaria, as you probably know, is spread by mosquitoes. And mosquitoes will breed absolutely anywhere. 
you know, in puddles, in buckets of water, in water tanks, drainage ditches, in, in bits of water in abandoned car tires, right? They're really tough to find. They went through all 300 square kilometers looking for any bits of water. Every bit of water they found, they screened for mosquito larvae. But not all mosquito species spread malaria. So every mosquito larva they found, they genotyped to see if it was one of the two main vector species in the area, which are Anopheles sargentii and Anopheles pharaoensis. That is an extraordinary amount of work, okay? It cost a fortune and it took a long time. So I said the cases were 2001 to 2004. The survey was 2005. So actually too late to be useful and has some implications that I'm gonna come back to in a minute. But if we zoom in, and show you what the geo profile looks like. It looks like this. There's some nice clusters uh, with the blue squares, and we know there are mosquitoes there. But which species? Now, we did this blind. Uh, I ran this analysis and sent it back to my colleague in Cairo and said, it's a real shame we didn't know which ones were the vectors. And he said, oh, we do. I forgot to tell you. <laughs> I was like, OK, do you want to send me that list? And it was the single most frustrating night of my research career because he said, I'm at home now, I'll do it in the morning. <laughs> so I basically sat up thinking, did I get this right? And it was worth it, because the red squares are the vector species. They found 10 breeding sites. They found 59 sites with, with mosquitoes. 10 of them had the vector. And you can see the model has done a fantastic job of finding them. Even if, and I'm going to come back to this as well, this one at the bottom right that we didn't find. So let's have a look broadly at what this has done. That entire map area is about 1,000 square kilometers. Now, the, the, the guys on the ground aren't stupid, right? They, they, they know their area, they know their disease. They're not looking in areas where there are no cases of malaria. They're not stupid, right? But the best, the best experts could do was search 300 square kilometers, and they found, as I say, 10 vector breeding sites. In about four seconds on my laptop, we find eight out of 10 searching 21 square kilometers. You can do that with 10 people in an afternoon, okay? And the crucial point is you can do it in real time during the outbreak. You don't have to search everywhere. You search where the model tells you. You don't have to genotype anything, actually. You kill the mosquitoes you find in those areas, end of story. So we're really excited about this. This seems to be a really good use of the model, and we're starting to do some work, uh, as I say, with, with different public health bodies uh, around this. All of this I can back up, but I'm actually going to finish by being very slightly more speculative. But I, I think I'm right. I just can't prove it. So <laughs> obviously, I think I'm right. I'm going to try and convince you, though. So I said we found 8 out of 10. There are two we didn't find. This is the one I pointed out a minute ago, and the one just clipped right at the top of the screen. You see the red square there? That's not particularly high up our surface. But the timing is important, right? The cases are 2001 to 2004. The survey was 2005. I actually think the ones we didn't find, there were certainly vector species there in 2005 because they found them, but I don't think they had anything to do with the cases we have. I think that's why we didn't find them. They weren't active in 2001 and 2004, even if they were there in 2005. But actually, I think the model's done yet better because we know how far mosquitoes travel, okay? There's a black dot right in the center there. And if we look at that, that circle has a radius of three kilometers. And three kilometers is pretty much the outside range a mosquito will fly from the breeding site before biting anyone. And the crucial point here is in that entire circle, there is not a single red square. They did not find a vector in that circle. Those people were bitten by something, and they didn't find it. I think we did. There are two yellow peaks there, right? And I think it's the opposite case now. I think there was something there either in 2001, 2, 3, or 4 that wasn't there in 2005, which is why they didn't find it, or they didn't find it because these things are hard to find. That's why you need the model, right? So the worst case scenario is we find eight out of 10 things that they found searching 21 square kilometers instead of 300. 
And I think we've done yet better than that. So I'm going to stop there, and I guess the take-home message for my talk, this works in criminology, okay? There are some problems with the maths in the, the model that they use, but they don't care because it works. You know, the FBI, the Metropolitan Police, they use this because it works. They're not, they're not going to use it otherwise. We've now done quite a lot of work showing this works in a range of different data sets with biological data, most crucially in disease biology. And just to say, first of all, I need to thank a whole bunch of collaborators and PhD students at the bottom. Uh, but also point out, if anyone's interested and, and keen to play around with this, the model is entirely open source. It's in a program called R, which is a statistical programming language. And you can download it with help files, dummy data sets, and things from there. The real benefit is I, that's the Cairo map again. And if you're my age and a fan of Joy Division, or pulsars, actually, for that matter, you can also plot any of those maps in exactly the same style as the Joy Division album, Unknown Pleasures. That was an afternoon's coding well spent. Uh, I'm going to finish there. Thank you very, very much for listening, and thank you for letting me come and talk to you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you.